Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'll start with the usual update on the most recent COVID statistics. An additional 18 positive cases were confirmed yesterday, which takes the total now in Scotland to 18,333. Now, today's figure for new cases is very low, and we're always going to see day-to-day -day variations in the data, but I think it is probably worth noting that this is the highest figure we have seen in almost three weeks. So we will, as you would expect, be looking into this uh, very closely today. And while we shouldn't jump to any conclusions, there's no reason for us to do that yet, I think it is a sharp reminder to all of us that this virus, as I keep saying, hasn't gone away. It is still present out there. So I'd ask you to remember that uh, in everything that you do. A total of 668 patients are currently in hospital with the virus, uh, either confirmed or suspected, which is 22 more than yesterday, but it includes a reduction of five in the number of confirmed cases. A total of 12 people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected COVID. Uh, that is three more than yesterday. Uh, one of those is confirmed, the other two suspected. And since 5th March, a total of 4,115 patients who had tested positive and been admitted to hospital have now been discharged from hospital. And I'm very pleased to report that during the past 24 hours, no deaths were registered of a patient confirmed through a test as having the virus. And the total number of deaths, therefore, remains at 2,490. Uh, of course, that's the number under that measurement of patients who test positive through a test. Uh, once again, I want to convey my condolences to everyone who has lost a loved one to this virus. And I also want to thank our health and care workers uh, for the incredible work they continue to do. I'm joined today by the Economy Secretary, who is going to talk in a few minutes about £38 million of support that the Scottish Government is providing for new companies in crucial sectors of the economy, which been, have been affected by the pandemic. Before that, though, I want to go over some of the key changes that the Scottish Government has announced, which will take effect over this weekend and into next week. Before I do that, though, I want to remind you of what I said uh, literally just a few seconds ago. This virus hasn't gone away, so life should still not feel totally normal. The lifting of restrictions, important and welcome though it undoubtedly is, mustn't mean the dropping of our guard. Uh, and that's really important. Uh, We've been in lockdown for more than three months now, but being in lockdown ourselves has meant that the virus has also been in lockdown. As we come out of lockdown, unfortunately, we let it out again too. So we have to work, in a sense, even harder to make sure that it doesn't get those opportunities to spread. So as you think about the changes, as you think about doing things that none of us have had the opportunity to do for three months, I, I appeal to all of you to think even more carefully about the basic things all of us can do and, I would argue, have a duty to do to try to make sure that this virus doesn't spread again. But let me start with two of the things which uh, will happen from next Wednesday, uh, the 15th of July. As many of you know, and uh, as many of you, uh, myself included, have been uh, eagerly anticipating, uh, hairdressers will reopen on the 15th. And I want to uh, say that detailed guidance for hairdressers has now been published. And therefore, if you are a hairdresser or if you are planning to visit a hairdresser and want to know what that guidance says, uh, you can find it now on the Scottish Government website. In addition, I announced yesterday that more people would be allowed to attend services for weddings, civil partnerships and funerals, but these would be subject to a cap on numbers. I can therefore confirm today that from Wednesday onwards, a maximum at this stage of 20 people will be able to attend a funeral, marriage or civil partnership ceremony or service, uh, wherever it is taking place. Uh, we're also removing the restrictions on the categories of people who can attend funerals. In many cases previously, attendance was limited to immediate family only. And I want to stress two points about these changes. Firstly, and I think this is an important one uh, for me to stress and for everybody watching to understand, uh, these changes apply only to services and ceremonies. Other gatherings associated with them, such as wedding receptions or funeral wakes, are still subject to the rules that apply for all other indoor and outdoor gatherings. And secondly, the limit of 20 people is still subject to strict rules on physical distancing. So if the venue uh, that you are having a ceremony or service in can accommodate 20 people when physical distancing rules are in place, the number of guests will have to be smaller. 
So I hope this provides some clarity for anyone who has a wedding or civil partnership in the second half of July or for anyone who unfortunately is having to arrange a funeral. We know that the restrictions on funeral services in particular have been incredibly tough, in many cases uh, utterly heartbreaking. I therefore hope that this change is a welcome one, although of course it still doesn't permit full-scale gatherings uh, for weddings, civil partnerships and funerals. Uh, it is, with a limit of 20, still quite restrictive, but at present we consider that to be a necessary precaution. But that limit will be reviewed again at the end of July. Let me now briefly summarise the key changes which take effect from today. Uh, first of all, it is uh, now compulsory to wear a face covering in shops as well as on public transport, and uh, Jason Leach is going to talk a bit more about that later. There are exemptions to this for children under five, people with certain health conditions, and in some circumstances for staff, but we uh, encourage uh, staff in most circumstances also to wear face coverings. Uh, but for the vast majority of us as customers, it is now the law that we wear face coverings in shops. Now, some people uh, ask, and I've been asked this question in recent days, why are we doing this now when the virus has been suppressed to low levels? And the, the reason is quite simple. Uh, we are now starting to go out and about a lot more. And that, as I said a moment ago, brings much greater risks of the virus spreading. So we have to put in place mitigations now that weren't as necessary when we were all staying at home all of the time to reduce the risk of that happening. The law coming into force today should not need to be enforced, uh, but the police can issue fines if necessary. But I'm asking everybody to stick to the law, not from a fear of enforcement, but because it's the right thing to do. It helps keep us and other people safe. I encourage people to see wearing a face covering for the foreseeable future when you go to the shops to become as automatic as putting a seatbelt is in a car already. If you wear a face covering in a shop or on a bus eh, or a train, it reduces your chances of passing the virus on to other people. And other people, when they wear a face covering, reduce their chances of passing the virus on to you. So it is one of the ways in which we can show care for and solidarity with each other and allow each other to live less restricted lives without seeing a resurgence in the virus. So please, uh, everybody, uh, comply with this because it is for the good of all of us. It will help keep us safe uh, and protect everybody. And the last uh, point I want to address about this, and it's again a point that's been put to me, that it's not very comfortable to wear a face covering. And the first thing I would say is, yeah, I, I recognise that. But also, um, you do get used to it, and I say that from personal experience. Uh, you get used to it, and it becomes uh, less uncomfortable the more you do it. But the second and perhaps most important thing to reflect on is this. Our health and care workers, in the course of their jobs to keep us safe, wear masks for 12-hour shifts. Uh, surgeons will wear them for lengthy, hours-long operations. This is a small thing that we can do for them and for each other. So please comply with this, not because the law tells you to, even although it does, but comply with it because it is about that solidarity and looking out for each other and through this whole experience, uh, looking out for the protection of our health. Now, there are other rules which come into force from today which affect how we can meet up with each other. If you are in the shielding category, from today, we're not asking you any longer to physically distance from the people you live with. Uh, you'll also be able to form an extended household if you live on your own or with children under the age of 18. And I know how tough the last few months have been uh, for all of you who have been shielding. And I hope these latest changes are helpful and welcome for many of you. Uh, the other changes that come into effect today don't apply to people who are shielding, unfortunately, but they do apply uh, to everyone uh, else. Uh, from today, if you're part of a non-cohabiting couple, regardless of your living arrangements, you don't need to stay physically distant from each other any longer, indoors or outdoors. Uh, for everyone else, there are some important changes to the rules for meeting up. For outdoor meetings, a maximum of 15 people from up to five different households can now meet together. And limited indoor gatherings, uh, subject to very strict guidance, are also now permitted. These should involve a maximum of eight adults from up to three households in total. So if you're thinking having, of having people attend, you can invite people from two other households because your household is, uh, the householder uh, is part of the three that is permitted. 
As long as physical distancing between different households is maintained, this can include overnight stays, but we recommend that in total you should not meet with people from more than four different households in any single day. That applies to adults. So if, for example, you have an outdoor meeting with four other households in the afternoon, don't then invite a couple of friends over in the evening. The ability to meet indoors, even in small numbers, is a simple pleasure that has been hard earned by all of us. So enjoy it. But please, please be very careful. Remember why we have only now started to allow any indoor meetings. It's because the risk of transmitting this virus indoors is higher and significantly higher than it is outdoors. So if you are able to meet outdoors, if the weather permits it, don't rule that out. That is still the safest way of meeting up with friends and family. But if you do meet indoors, take care and follow all of the public health advice. Keep two metres distant from people in other households. Clean surfaces after people are touching them. Wash your hands regularly and especially wash your hands the first time you go into uh, somebody's house. If we do all of that, then this is not risk free, but we will minimise the number of opportunities the virus has to spread. And that is the point I want to end on. Uh, COVID cases right now in Scotland are very low, uh, but as today's figures remind us, we are still seeing new cases every day. The virus hasn't gone away. It's just as infectious as it ever was, and it's just as dangerous as it ever was. Uh, and if we let it run out of control again, not only will that be very damaging to life and to health, it will also set back the economic recovery that is so important now for our wider uh, lives. So that's why I keep stressing and will end with a reminder of the facts that we're asking people to remember and comply with. Face coverings in shops and public transport, that's the law, but in any enclosed space where physical distancing is difficult, avoid crowded places, indoors but also outdoors, clean your hands and hard surfaces regularly, two metre distancing remains the rule and self-isolate and book a test if you have symptoms. If all of us remember and abide by these five measures, then we have the best possible chance as we uh, interact with each other much more of nevertheless keeping this virus under control. So my thanks as always for your cooperation. I'm now going to ask uh, the Economy Secretary to set out uh, the economic intervention that we want to announce today and then I'll hand over to the National Clinical Director. Thank you, First Minister. Uh, as we move into phase three of the route map, we will now see yet more areas of the economy reopening. Uh, we are continuing to provide advice to allow this to be done safely uh, with updated retail and hospitality guidance publishing today. The guidance and our safe approach to reopening our economy will give consumers the confidence they need to support businesses as they reopen. There is no doubt that the coronavirus pandemic has caused unprecedented economic disruption, and that is why we reacted swiftly to provide a business support package worth more than £2.3 billion. We continue to work hard to address the wider impacts and yesterday announced new initiatives to support the housing market and to help people into work and to retrain. And I look forward to giving more details on the further £100 million that is being invested in employment support soon. At this time, more than ever, we need economic growth to support recovery. We need to find ways to support our most innovative sectors because their access to finance has been severely restricted. That is why today I want to outline details of further support we are making available for them. This marks a step forward in our recovery and in developing a high-tech, low-carbon economy that accelerates international investment and creates rewarding high-value jobs. We need to promote growth in areas such as life sciences, digital technologies and space, where Scotland already has a competitive edge and international ambitions. So I'm pleased to be able to announce details of a £38 million package for our most promising early stage businesses. This funding was allocated last month as part of our £230 million economic stimulus and it has three main elements. A £3 million fund to issue grants to early stage startups with the highest potential to grow and attract investment. A £25 million early stage growth challenge fund to provide successful applicants with a mixture of grants and investment funding 
of up to £300,000, and the fund will open to applications on Monday, the 20th of July. In addition, we are providing £10 million for Scottish Enterprises' existing co-investment funds to help stimulate private investment and support businesses that need more significant levels of funding to grow rapidly. These measures will be taken forward by Scottish Enterprise, working with private investors and partners. So the package is another example of how we are tailoring our support to best suit Scotland's economic needs with schemes that are unique to Scotland. But if we are to con continue to do so, we need the UK government to extend our financial powers. While we welcome some of the measures set out by the Chancellor earlier this week, in particular the reduction on VAT for tourism and hospitality, which we've been asking them to do for some time. More could have been done, such as a commitment to uh, new capital spending as a stimulus for economic growth, or an extension of the furlough scheme, particularly for key sectors. Earlier this week, the UK government also recognised our calls for more support for culture and heritage, and there are a number of areas where immediate support is required, including grassroots music venues, and museums. We are working closely with each of these sectors to develop support packages and will announce more details in due course. However, today I am pleased to confirm that I have agreed a £2.2 million fund with the Music Venues Trust for the coming months, which will quickly provide much needed stability to grassroots venues for the coming period. Full details will be released soon and I hope this offers some comfort to those in the industry. So it's clear we are continuing to make progress in our recovery, but as I have said before, we can only continue to do this if the virus remains suppressed. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank businesses for working with us and for playing their part by following advice and guidance to help keep people safe so they, in turn, can support business with confidence. Many thanks, Fiona, and Jason, Yes, I want to return to the subject of face coverings since today is such an important day when we make it mandatory in retail. People are perhaps slightly confused about what a face covering is and what we mean. We do not mean the full surgical face masks that I and many others have had to wear throughout our careers. You may see these disposable, uh, non-surgical, but they look like surgical face masks in Shops and retail, you may pick them up at the main railway stations and bus stations. They're perfectly satisfactory, but you should use them just that one time and discard them. Increasingly online, you can now get fabric uh, face coverings made by thousands and thousands of people around Scotland and around the world, uh, and they are equally acceptable. You can now buy them in many of our retail establishments. The design of them seems to get more elaborate every day, but this is mine, quite plain and simple. The... The secret is to cover your nose and your mouth with two layers of fabric. That may be a scarf or a pashmina or something else that you have available. You may want to look online at the government's website or other websites about how to make one from the remnants of a cotton t-shirt or whatever. But the, the key thing is to cover your nose and mouth. These coverings are now mandatory in public transport and in shops, with certain exceptions that I'll come to in just a moment. They do not, however, make you invincible. They do not mean you haven't to follow the other steps of distancing, hand hygiene, respiratory hygiene, and all of that together will help us restrict the spread of coronavirus. These face coverings are now mandatory on public transport and shops, but you should also wear them in any other enclosed space where physical distancing is more difficult, particularly if they're at risk, you're at risk of close contact with others. That might include care home visits to the elderly, visits to hospitals as an outpatient, visits to GP surgeries or pharmacies. There is no evidence, though, that you need to wear them outdoors walking between these elements. Uh, only if you're in an unavoidable, crowded situation, even outdoors. There are some exemptions for children under five. You should apply individual discretion for children and adults who have perhaps breathing difficulties, but I'd ask you to not just not do it because you think you can't. Test it, try it. And actually many asthmatics and many with lung disease are able for limited periods of time to wear them perfectly satisfactorily. The other group which require a little bit of discretion and a little bit of understanding from all of us are those who are perhaps living 
with autism or living with autistic people and those with dementia and other learning disabilities, perhaps. And you should be cautious about creating a stigma or policing it yourself because you see a family, perhaps, with a child who doesn't wear one. Please don't do that. Think of yourself and don't worry too much about others. When applying or removing them, please use hand sanitizer, wash your hands before you put them on, and wash your hands when you take them off again. As we enter phase three, as the First Minister has said, that's why we are upping the game around face coverings. They do help us reduce the risk of transmission, along with all of the other elements of our facts campaign. First Thank Minister. Uh, I'll move to questions now. Uh, first question today is uh, Jamie McIver from BBC Scotland. You there, Jamie? I do. Apologies, First Minister. Okay. Good afternoon. I'd like to stay on the issue of face coverings. Concerns being expressed by some disabled people that abuse towards them is increasing over the issue of face coverings. They say the guidance isn't always sufficiently clear about exemptions. And how can someone convince a shop assistant they are exempt from wearing a face covering if they've been told by GPs that they're not issuing covering letters or notes? Well, I don't want to see anybody uh, abused or uh, treated in an unacceptable way. If somebody uh, is stating that they have a, a condition that is exempt under the regulations we've laid, uh, then you know that is is, is fine, and and nobody who is exempt uh, should be uh, made to wear one. But that's a, a minority uh, of people. And as Jason said, uh, there may be some people who, who are covered by these exemptions who think that they couldn't wear a, a face covering. It might be worth trying it and just to see whether it is comfortable for a very limited period while you're, you're doing your shopping. And, you know, I keep saying this because w when I first uh, started to, to wear one uh, some weeks back, um, I thought I'm never going to get used to this. You, you know, I wear glasses to read and I, my glasses steamed up and you just feel that you can't breathe properly. I now don't really think about it when I put one on. It feels, I wouldn't say it feels absolutely natural, but it's not something that I feel any great discomfort. So, so give it a go, try it. You know, we often when these, and, and they very rarely come in, in in the context we're in just now of a, a global pandemic, but you know, I'm old enough uh, to remember when seatbelt wearing became mandatory. Uh, we all often we also have uh, drink driving laws that, that change uh, from time to time um, and you know at the start of any of this there's always a sense this is never going to work it's never going to be enforced I remember when the ban on smoking in public places came in people said people are never going to comply with this it's going to be a nightmare and the police are never going to be able to enforce it but all of these things work because people recognize that it is whatever the inconveniences it's for our own protection and it's for the protection of others and that's the spirit I really appeal to people to see this in and, and to approach it in um, don't whether it's over face coverings or because they're asking you to physically distance or you know quarantine things that you pick up in a shop do not abuse a shop worker that is not um, appropriate in any circumstances, uh, and it's not appropriate now either. So if you don't agree with the decision on face coverings, you're welcome to email me and tell me that. Uh, that's your, your democratic right. The, the decision is a decision the Scottish Government has taken. It's not a decision that a shop worker has taken, so don't take it out on them if you disagree with that decision. But think about why we've done it, and then maybe you'll find your disagreement uh, doesn't seem as as vehement as you might have thought. And I come back to this point, uh, you know, we've all, many of us have got family who work in the health service, uh, our health workers in particular, they wear these things for hours and hours and hours on end um, and they don't complain about it. So this is a tiny thing we can do to keep ourselves safe and to save lives. And I ask people to see it in that spirit. Uh, Gordon Cree from STV. Thank you. This is a question for both yourself and Jason Leach because it touches on both policy and advice, I think. You outlined yesterday the phase three changes and we can read the sort of broad plans of the phase four ones for the future. But do you feel or even fear that in the absence of a vaccine or the virus dying out, we're getting close to the ceiling of what you're going to be comfortable with? And if that is the case, is that going to make it a more difficult challenge for you to keep hearts and minds engaged in all the measures, particularly things like social distancing from friends, which understandably people maybe find the most difficult? So that's a very good question. And um, as I've often said over the, the months standing here, I don't know absolutely 
what the detailed answer to that is yet. And I, as, as I do know, and, and as we work out what the answer is, we will set that out very clearly or as clearly as we can to you. I'd ask you to, to think back to something I said quite some time ago and actually to something I said yesterday. Um, some time ago, we said back in April, I think, when we published the first... Um, the first document that set out kind of how we would go about in very general terms coming out of lockdown. And I remember saying then is that until there's a vaccine, we're, we're going to be living with elements of this for a long time. Um, and that remains the case. Uh, what we do know is the lower we can get the levels of it, the more normality we can bring back. So there's a bit of a trade off here that the more patience we exercise now and the more we stick by the rules and the more we suppress it, get it as close to the those, uh, that level of elimination as we can, then the more we can allow test and protect and these very targeted measures to keep any spikes under control. Uh, but physical distancing, things like that, don't assume that they are going to be, uh, those requirements are going to be lifted anytime soon. The facts that I keep talking about, these are things you should get used to doing because it is likely you're going to have to be doing these for quite some time to come. And the thing I said yesterday was, was this, I, we, we've been in a three week cycle uh, which uh, we, we hoped we would be in terms of moving from one phase to another. Um, so three weeks between phase one and phase two and three weeks between phase two and phase three. I said yesterday, I wouldn't assume at the moment that it will be a three week gap now from phase three to phase four. Uh, and why is that the case? Partly because of the scale um, of the changes we've introduced or will introduce over the course of phase three. We need to really be cautious to assess the impact of those. And uh, we also know that phase four uh, requires us to reach a, a judgment that this is not the big public health risk that it has been for the last three months. And I don't feel we are yet close to that point. So we keep this under review, uh, but I would prepare to be in phase three for a, a bit longer than, than three weeks. And so to go back, uh, it's a long-winded way of trying to address your question. Is it the ceiling? Not forever, I hope. But it may be for a period that the changes I outlined, uh, outlined yesterday, with maybe what, some change around the margins of the number of people you're able to meet and such like. But fundamentally, um, you know, what I outlined yesterday was big change. Change that, to be candid, makes me even more nervous than I was when we went into phase one. So let's, let's live with this for a period, see how it goes and get used to doing all these other things that will be required to keep this thing under control. Jason. I, Gordon, I, I don't like Fridays after route map changes. I, I, I genuinely don't. I, I get more anxious the more we open. But I am also conscious of the other harms that lockdown is causing. So I am comfortable with the transitions, but I am particularly nervous about indoors and larger groups. That, that's not a surprise to anybody who's followed this pandemic. The World Health Organization gave a press conference yesterday, one of their regular press conferences, uh, and I would commend it to people who think this is over. They said, this is not controlled in much of the world and worsening in many countries. So we're not out of this. Scotland is doing well, in inverted commas, uh, and I am comfortable with our journey out of the route map. But I, I remain very cautious, and I agree with the First Minister. I don't think phase three of the route map will be over in two or three weeks. We have to make sure the changes we're putting in now are not seeing a significant rise in community transmission in order for us to progress. It's just as simple as that. Uh, Phil McDonald from Global. Thanks, First Minister. Um, just going back to face coverings, I spoke to a few shopkeepers this morning who said that they didn't feel they were in a position to enforce mandatory face coverings, either because they couldn't afford security staff at the door or just because they didn't feel it was their responsibility. So do you feel the policy may cause difficulties for staff and what would your advice be to them? So shop owner, uh, shop workers, I, I've said all along, we do not expect you to enforce it. Yeah, if a customer uh, can be encouraged to wear one when they're not, that is fine. But if a customer is is refusing, it's not your job to force them to do it. Uh, and the, the, the enforcement part of this, if it is necessary, falls to the police. Now, as I've, I've said a couple of times already today in interviews, and I think I said it here earlier on, uh, you know, we, we don't expect a police officer to check every time we get into a car to, to, to see that we're putting our seatbelt on. But if they catch us without it, they'll take action against us. Uh, but so do see the enforcement of this in the same way. But the, the key here is for all of us as responsible citizens 
to do it because it's the right thing, to do it because the law says it is required, but more fundamentally than that, do it because it is the right thing. When I, and, and I, I suspect this is true, I was going to say for 99% of us, I suspect this is true for as close to 100% as anything will get of the population. When I get into a car, I don't put my seatbelt on because my head is telling me that the law tells me to do it or that the police will find me if, if I get caught not doing it. I put my seatbelt on because I know that if the car crashes, having the seatbelt on will protect me and may protect other people as well if I'm not f flying about the car without a, a seatbelt on. So that's why we should all wear face coverings. Uh, the law can enforce it, but don't make the law enforce it. Do it because it's the right thing. So many of us, the vast bulk of the population, over three, almost four now, long, hard months have done the right thing at great personal cost and sacrifice. And that's why we are where we are today. So let's keep doing the right things. What those things are are changing as we come out of lockdown, but they are just as important now to comply with. So, you know, that's my plea to everybody. Don't ever put a shop worker into the, the position of having to enforce it uh, because it's not their job. Uh, but don't make them feel uncomfortable about it. Uh, and don't even put the police into the position of having to enforce it. They've got better things to do because all of us should be doing this for the right reason. Alan Smith from Bower. Thank you, First Minister. Uh, Radio 4 uh, today is reporting that just one out of 477 short-term lets in Edinburgh's communal stairwells has the right planning consent. Um, with this type of holiday accommodation set to resume from next Wednesday, there's a great deal of concern from residents living in those blocks, and there are calls for the Scottish Government to, to review the decision to allow them to operate again from Wednesday. So I was just wondering, what is your message to residents, and is there any likelihood that this this decision would be reviewed. Um, I'm not familiar with the detail of the story you're reporting uh, today. Obviously, planning consent is a local authority um, responsibility. Uh, I will go away and have a look at that. Uh, what uh, this issue was raised with me in Parliament uh, yesterday, and and uh, in the context of you know often uh, claims of antisocial behaviour uh, around short-term holiday lets. And the point I made then, and I would say, if if any premises operating without the, the proper planning consent is separate to coronavirus, that is not acceptable. Uh, and, you know, we, we need to tackle that uh, side of it almost regardless of coronavirus. But clearly people's concerns are heightened because of that. But uh, as I say, I don't know the detail of that. Um, I don't know if it's something, I, I don't think either of us uh, know the detail of that right now, but we will go away and look at it. And if there's any uh, change to our previous decisions that we think are necessary because of that, obviously we would communicate that in the, the usual way. Tom Eden from PA. Thank you, First Minister. Phil got in early with my question, so I'm just scrabbling around for some more technical ones. Um, just to the, the Economy Secretary, um, you mentioned the new funding. Uh, how are you going to decide what businesses will be eligible um, and what are the criteria for that? Um, and to you, First Minister, um, on pubs uh, reopening on Wednesday, we saw when they did in England, uh, they opened from six o'clock in the morning. Do you think that's a sensible idea for here in Scotland from Wednesday? Um, I will come back to that. I'll hand over to Fiona. I should say as a, a, a sort of a pre-comment to Fiona is don't ever feel the need to find more and more technical questions um, at these briefings. It's, it's not compulsory. Um, but Fiona, do you want to take that question? So there's going to be three million pounds allocated uh, up to £50,000 uh, and advisor support for startups that are actually identified as those already that can benefit and grow and obviously create um, economic wealth and indeed jobs for the country. Uh, £25 million of that will be the Early Stage Growth Challenge Fund. And so therefore that will be a competitive area that opens on Monday the 20th in terms of a mix of grant and investment funding. And that also will be uh, support equity-backed businesses, private investment to get behind that. Uh, in terms of those that are considering that, we'll be working with universities, we'll be working with entrepreneurs and others. We're setting up panels to judge which are the best um, opportunities uh, for growth on that. So it'll be a combination of identifying uh, potential, but also inviting those companies in those areas that can provide high growth. These are early stage, high growth companies. And that competitive edge, I think, will also make sure that the challenge that we're presenting will provide the best opportunities for growth and jobs in these, these sectors. Yeah, thank you for that. And on the question about pubs opening, uh, pubs will be able to open in line with their normal licence conditions. So it's not an, an abnormal uh, sort of arrangement around opening. I'd say... 
Uh, two additional things to that. The evidence I've got uh, so far is that pubs have been very responsible in the, the outdoor opening that has been allowed already for a few days. And I would hope and expect that the pubs will be responsible when it comes to, to indoor opening. Uh, it may be that not all pubs choose to open immediately. There may be more of a, a phased uh, reopening of, of the sector. But certainly I would encourage, because as I say in my experience and what I've, has been reported to me, this is happening, that, that pubs should make sure they've got all the, the right uh, rules and, and regulations and, and mitigating measures in place. Uh, the other point I would make is the, the very conscious decision we took and as you keep hearing me say at this podium, I'm, all governments are taking difficult decisions just now, so I'm just going to speak for our own. Um, we decided uh, deliberately not to open outdoor or indoor at a weekend um, on a Saturday or, or Sunday, um, because I think doing it during the week when not everybody but more people are, are working um, allows, I think, for a, a smoother uh, transition back to, uh, to pubs being open. And my last point, I, I said two, I'll, I'll make three quickly is that we all have a responsibility here so as as the public as as consumers if you are thinking of going to a pub make sure you comply with all the rules make sure you're doing everything they're asking you to do and make sure you're following all the hygiene measures that we are advising so if we all do the right things here then these openings can happen uh, without the risk that Jason and I feel very nervous about but we've all got a part to play in ensuring that that's the case. Scott McNabb from the Scotsman. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Um, gyms and swimming pools are poised to reopen in England um, on the 25th of this month. I think they've already reopened in Northern Ireland. But you made it clear yesterday they're not part of the immediate thinking um, for Phase 3. And given what you've said about Phase 3 earlier today, could you give us some indication of what the thinking is for gyms? and swimming pools um, in Scotland. And also, if I may, on the 18 uh, positive cases today, which you said you will be looking at, is there any suggestion that they are um, connected? Are they in the same geographical area, for example? Um, on that point, no, there is not any suggestion at the moment that they're connected. Uh, I've had a, an initial uh, look at them, and I know Jason uh, will be looking at them in more detail later on, as will I. They look as if they are fairly dispersed across the country, uh, and uh, but we will be looking very carefully at this. I don't want to, you know, I, I, I thought uh, for, for a good few minutes, actually, before coming into this briefing, whether even to draw attention to this uh, and, and to try to get the balance right. Um, 18 is a small number, uh, but it is three times the number we reported yesterday, and it's the highest number since the uh, 21st of June, I think. So it's not nothing, but we shouldn't jump to conclusions. And as we saw with Dumfries and Galloway, uh, the systems we have in place now through Test and Protect uh, gives us the ability to really look carefully at anything that's given us any cause for concern. So that will be work that the experts are doing over the course of today. If we think it does give any cause for concern, then we will openly say that. But at the moment, um, Let's assume it's just a, a variation that we'll see day on day, but just to give an assurance that we look at these things really, really closely. Uh, and as I say, that should give people some sense of assurance rather than uh, be at this stage a cause for uh, concern. And uh, you remind me, uh, Scott, what your first question was. Gyms, gyms and swimming pools. Um, so we are thinking carefully about these things on an ongoing basis. Just because we haven't given a date for something right now, if, if you run a gym or a swimming pool or if you want to use these places, don't assume it's not in our heads and we're not thinking about it. We just can't do everything at once and we need to think about particularly places that we know pose particular challenges and, and gyms and, and swimming pools are, are in that category. Um, but we will continue to assess these things and get to the point where we can give dates for opening as quickly as possible. It's maybe worth saying something about the, the point about phase three maybe lasting longer. Um, because I think it probably will last longer than three weeks. That doesn't absolutely mean we won't be able to do anything beyond what we've announced right now in phase three. Um, so don't take it from that, that there is absolutely no chance of anything else opening. But going back to, I think, the, the question Gordon Cree said, we, we, we're doing a lot next week. We're doing an awful lot next week. And Jason's talked about his anxiety. Take it as red. I feel that anxiety um, as well. So we just need to be 
a bit careful for the next uh, couple of weeks to make sure that we understand the impact of the things that we are doing. But for those business premises or those aspects of life that haven't yet been given the go-ahead, we have not forgotten about you. Uh, that's true of gyms, swimming pools, it's true of the, the live entertainment sector, which I know um, fear that they're going to be one of the last uh, sectors to open. We have not forgotten and we want to work with you and keep working with you to give as much clarity as possible as soon as possible. Uh, Tom Martin from the Daily Express. Hi, good afternoon and thank you, First Minister. Um, just ahead of um, the reopening of places of worship, in your statement yesterday, um, you said restrictions on singing and chanting would have to remain. I just wondered, could you give a bit more clarity of what that means in practice? Does it mean no outright no communal singing, for example? And perhaps for the National Clinical Director, I just wondered if he could explain a little bit of the science around this issue and whether, you know, for instance, different types of singing pose different degrees of risk. Say, for example, you know, somebody belting something out on a pub karaoke compared to somebody, you know, sitting, singing along to hymns in a church, for example. I'm not sure if that was uh, from personal experience you were... Uh... Asking there, Tom, uh, the belting out on the karaoke part. Um, can I say on the part of your question to me, and then I'll hand over uh, pretty quickly to Jason. As I said in Parliament yesterday, we're still finalising this guidance with faith communities. So um, I'm not yet going to give a, a definitive answer to exactly what that means. These are some of the details that we, we want to work through. But um, I would say to anybody who is uh, looking forward to going back to their place of worship uh, over the, the next couple of weeks that don't assume that uh, singing is necessarily going to be a part of that uh, because the science does tell us, and I will now hand over to the person who's much more qualified to talk about it than I am, that that is a, a particularly risky uh, behaviour. The, the science is not overly convincing, if I'm completely honest, but if you use your common sense, this is a droplet spread virus in the main, and it settles on surfaces. And therefore, we're nervous about choirs indoors. We're nervous about karaoke, which you've just described, and you can see why. And we're also nervous about particularly gatherings that are broad age ranges. Churches tend, in Scotland, particularly Christian places of worship, tend to be a little bit more elderly than some other gatherings. Other faiths have a much broader group of people, but maybe bigger groups. And then some faiths, like our Jewish community, do responsive singing and chanting back and forward, facing in both directions. So we're just a little bit anxious about it. So we're keen to get places of worship back. So we're gonna do that like we have in other sectors in a staged way. So hopefully some numbers that they haven't been able to get up until this point, physically distanced, hand washing, probably I think no communal singing for now. And the other thing I would mention is you need to go to some, perhaps some different churches, Tom, where it sounds much like the loud karaoke. Um, but I should say that this, in a slightly different format, will also be a feature of some of the guidance for pubs, for example, because what we're talking about here is a phenomenon where people are, are maybe breathing more deeply to, to sing or, or to shout over noise. So in a pub, uh, don't expect loud music for a while. That will be one of the restrictions in pubs so that people are not in an environment where they're having to shout to be heard. So some of these things that maybe don't immediately seem obvious when you're talking about controlling a virus, will become a way of life as we start to go back to these places. Christine Lavelle from The Sun. Thanks, First Minister. Um, it was just uh, last night the Foreign Office issued guidance advising against uh, cruise ship travel uh, based on medical advice they've received from Public Health England. Um, would you also warn Scots against booking cruises? And if people do go on them, would they be required to quarantine on their return? Um, and also, where do cruise ship operator, operators stand with regards to coming to Scotland at the moment? Um, on that latter part, I, I will need to go away and get you the, the proper detailed answer to, to that. Uh, the quarantine regulations are, as I set out earlier in the week, and, and you can find uh, the detail of that in the regulations. But in, in relation to the first part of your question, yes, I would echo that advice. I don't think going on a cruise right now is something that uh, I would do, and I, it's not something that I would advise uh, people to do. If you cast your mind back to uh, the early part of, of this pandemic, uh, outbreaks on cruise ships was uh, certainly something that was a feature. Um, the other point, just in quarantine, which 
to be fair to you, you didn't ask me, but it's worth noting that I stood here the other day and said that we weren't yet lifting quarantine for Spain and, and Serbia. Uh, we'll keep that under review, but the, the UK government has now removed Serbia from the exemption list as well. So uh, there is uh, now alignment on that particular point. Jason, do you want to say more about cruise ships? Cruises, we, we discussed cruises at the senior clinicians group this week. We have a, as you know, Christine, we have a four country senior clinicians group that meets in the evening once or twice a week. And we, I don't like saying this to the cruise industry, but we, between us, couldn't really think of anywhere worse and anywhere better for the virus. So our, our position was exactly the same as Public Health England's, that for now, cruise ships, particularly large cruise ships, that we, it was pointed out to us that there is a difference between a small cruise ship in the Greek islands with two families on it and a large cruise ship with seven and a half thousand people on it. So the, there is guidance in there about what those differences are. But in the main, enclosed spaces, warm, often poorly ventilated, it, it was ju it's just too good for this virus. Daniel Sanderson from The Telegraph. Uh, thank you very much, First Minister. Um, just back on face coverings, um, when, you, when you spoke about, you know, it becoming as, as natural as wearing a seatbelt, and that sounds like a fairly sort of permanent shift in, in people's mentality. So I wonder if you could help with how long people should expect this to last year. Or could it just be a couple of months until we enter a next phase? Or, or could this be until there's a, a vaccine? And also, oh, Professor Leach, um, just on the, the slight spike in daily cases, um, I think you've said before it could take two or three weeks for uh, um, the, the sort of cases to, to show up, if you like, after someone becomes exposed to the virus. So how likely do you think it is that this could be linked to some of the easing we saw about three weeks ago in, in phase two? Thank you. I'll hand over to Jason in a second. Um, in your first question, if I could answer the question how long, I think I'd be in demand from every scientific organisation probably across the globe uh, right now. I, I don't know how long. And as I said at the outset of this, that's not a, a answer that politicians are particularly comfortable giving. I've got more comfortable with it, it's fair to say, over the past three months, but I don't know. I can't answer that question. I, I certainly hope it's not permanent, like seat belts will be, but I, I think it is for the foreseeable future. Um, and therefore, it's as well getting into that habit now and, and feeling as comfortable and treating it as much as, as an automatic instinct as we do seat belts now. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm using that analogy. But, you know, I certainly hope we will get to a stage where we no longer have to do it. Um, but that's not going to be any time in the immediate future. So prepare to, to, to live with this for a bit of time. So get comfortable with it is basically what I'm encouraging people to do. Jason. Two, two things. Uh, yes, increased cases, hospitalizations, ICU admissions could potentially relate to what we do. Uh, of, of course it could. So as we move through the route map, we will have to keep a very, very close eye on those data and how they react. It takes about a week to get sick, a week, a week to get infected, another week to get sick, and then another week to get very sick, roughly. It doesn't always work like that. And that's why three weeks is a public health-led route map change. And that's why we talk like that. There was a meeting this morning between Public Health Scotland and the Scottish Government, like there is every single day, and they already knew that we, when we met later in the morning, would ask them. So they were already ready for what they knew of the 18 cases. And there is no suggestion that these 18 cases are connected. We don't know that they are uh, as the result of one thing. It would be unusual if they were, but we're gonna look into them as the day proceeds. And we'll look again tomorrow into the ones that happen tomorrow. I, I hope they are stable and reducing. If they go up over the next few days, then we'll have to look in very, very deep and serious ways about what has led to those cases. and. Uh, just as there is progression through the route map, I, I, I'm a bit loath to say it, but there's also a reverse gear in the route map. So the advisers could potentially tell the First Minister to go backwards. I, I, of course, don't want to do that, but that has to be available to us if we see numbers go in the wrong direction. I don't want to do it either, but I've always been straight with you. If I feel it is necessary for the protection of health and life, uh, we, will, we will do so because we've seen what happens when this virus runs out of control. But let's not, uh, let's not read too much into this just now. If there is anything to worry about in these cases, that will become obvious in the next few days and we will set out then if, if there is anything we think we need to do. But all of us have a part to play in making sure this virus stays under control, uh, which is why I sometimes stand here 
thinking I sound like the voice of, of doom around the virus. I'm not. I can't wait to get shot of the whole thing. But I know how dangerous it is and I know how quickly it will spread again. We see it happening in many other parts of the world right now. Uh, so we must, must not drop our guard, even as we all enjoy these additional freedoms that we are going to uh, be experiencing over the next few days. Paul Malik from The Courier. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, First Minister. Um, I'm just looking for a bit of clarification on the reasons why um, wedding and funeral ceremonies have been capped at 20 people. Um, just put that into the context of uh, you could go to a beer garden at the moment where they can accommodate more than 20 strangers at a time, but you might not be able to have a wedding ceremony with 20 people where presumably you'd be able to contact them should one of you contract the virus. So it's a good question, Paul, and it's, it's the kind of question I find myself asking as I kind of learn more about how we need to deal with these things. And and it's one of these things where on the face of it, you think that doesn't make sense. But when you think about it a bit more, it, it maybe does. So to take the beer garden right now, you, you're right. In total, a beer garden may have more than 20 people, but the, the group you are in it should still be limited in terms of households and numbers. And you're probably not going to be... Uh, well, I'm not saying never, but you're probably not going to be up, you know, hugging uh, somebody in another uh, group that has nothing to do with yours. Think about a wedding, though. The 20 people in a wedding are all going to know each other really well. You, you are probably going to be part of the same family um, or, you know, different uh, families that are very closely connected or two families that are becoming uh, very closely connected. So, the, the tendency to be a bit closer to each other, although we are still saying you should be physically distanced, but the tendency maybe to, to, to not stick to that um, is, is potentially greater. So it's about caution and, and just being a bit more careful about it because of the context of it. So you will often find this is not perfect. Um, there's lots of anomalies in what we're doing right now because we're dealing with such a an absurd feeling situation. Um, and some of these things won't make perfect sense, to be candid about it. But usually, if you see something that doesn't appear to make sense, um, there's usually a bit of uh, sort of analysis behind it. And that's basically, in, in summary, uh, the reason why weddings are capped at a lower level than you might get in the totality of a beer garden. Do you want to add no, that's, to that? No, that's exactly right. Uh, Tom Peterkin from the PNJ. And thank you. Good afternoon, First Minister. To go back to the, the subject of indoor gyms, um, Alistair S. Robertson, who's the M MD of Sport Aberdeen, has described delaying the reopening of indoor gyms as devastating. He says it defies belief that pubs and cinemas will be open earlier. Um, he says the leisure industry has worked incredibly hard to make venues safe and believes that people will be safer in one of his venues than, than in a pub. He also talks about the catastrophic financial blow to the gym industry, where 20,000 people and 2,000 facilities are at risk. Why um, has, have, do pubs appear to be prioritised over gyms? This is not about um, an order of priority. It's about trying to work our way through this as, as rationally as we can, recognising the different risks associated with not just different settings but also different behaviours in those settings and this is devastating for everybody my, my heart my heart breaks for every business that is not open yet and doesn't have a date to open so I, I absolutely have sympathy with the, the gentleman that you you have quoted at me there just now and it's not because we don't want gyms to open it's because we have to do this as as carefully as we can and as rationally as we can, although as I just said to um, to Paul there will always be apparent anomalies uh, in this but we want to to get everywhere open as quickly as we can but we have to do it carefully uh, Jason do you want to say a bit more about maybe some of the the more scientific uh, reasons behind why one place and not another it feels slightly inadequate to, to describe the science because I understand if you own the gym it's a pretty essential business to you and your family and your workers it, it feels hard to keep places closed my, my inbox fills up after each route map change with the new aggrieved group that we haven't opened so six weeks ago it was hairdressers and now now I don't get emails from hairdressers at all anymore so it's really hard but if you think of surfaces you think of crowds you think of ventilation you think of indoors then all of these elements add up to swimming pools gyms other areas that we haven't yet opened bingo halls 
up being later on in this process. And I, it's really hard to create that list from all the sectors and industries that are available. There, there's a still support for those industries at some level, and the, the Cabinet Secretary can help with that part of the question, but the, the public health elements of it rely on all the things you know, indoors, crowds, ventilation. And of course, because we knew that some areas were going to be closed, that's why we provided uh, the rates relief, particularly for those areas in hospitality, leisure, as gyms are, uh, and tourism, and also in terms of the grants that were available, particularly for those that were under £51,000, and also uh, in order to ensure that we provided additional support for sectors that weren't covered by the, the general UK provision, what we also did was to make sure that it was a, a, the, a creative uh, hospitality and tourism sector and uh, fund, and also one that was about uh, pivotal resilience. So for those that were particularly important in terms of the numbers of people they employed and also the potential for growth and the impact they had. Now, some of them may or may not have been gyms, but there's been a variety of different support in place. But it's hard, and it's hard for those businesses. And it's important that we recognise that when we can come back, which I, I hope can happen, that we support those businesses and there'll be a lot of people want to come back. And I think there's been a lot of versatility with gyms, with uh, out, outdoors provision, for example, taking place to ensure that that pent up uh, need for uh, that activity uh, can still take place, however, not in uh, inside as yet. Uh, Vivian Aitken from the record. Afternoon, First Minister, can I talk to you today about the football announcement that came out this morning? Um, before shutdown of football and other things you said at the time that you didn't think it was possible to have football played behind closed doors because of your concerns that crowds may gather outside football stadiums anyway can I ask you why that's no longer a concern and can I also ask if police are now going to have to um, police for want of a better word the stadiums while the matches are going on even though there's no crowds inside um, also on the subject of football um, can you tell us if friendly matches before August the 1st will still be allowed to go on and when realistically can we expect to see crowds getting back into the game? Um, Jason, uh, as more of a footballing authority than I am, may want to say a bit more about this. I, I think, in fairness to myself, I don't think I said it wasn't possible to have football behind closed doors. I, I made the observation at the outset of this pandemic that that wouldn't necessarily uh, resolve the issues we were dealing with because it, fans at that stage may still have, have come together. Uh, some of these judgments change just because we're at a different phase of dealing with this. That was at a point when we were going into lockdown. This is a point where we're coming out of lockdown and if we don't allow sport to start up behind closed doors, um, then we're not doing it at all for a period because it is not yet safe in our judgment to have crowds uh, of spectators in to see a football or a rugby match. So those judgments have to, I guess, adapt as we come out of a lockdown uh, versus when we went into it. Um, I, at this stage, can answer the question of when uh, fans will be allowed back into stadiums um, but I, I wouldn't expect it any time soon uh, for the reasons that, that we uh, know about but I hope uh, for uh, sport for football for rugby the announcement today uh, that behind closed doors uh, matches can get underway is, is welcome uh, but I'll hand over to Jason. I think it's a, an important announcement today it's been a uh, very very well managed by the organisations in charge of football rugby and other team sports and by the Scottish Government and Act of Scotland, it, it is quite l low levels. So this is, in football, this is only the Scottish Premiership. It's not the other leagues, so it's quite limited. We've learned a lot from other professional leagues opening around Europe, including the English Premiership, but also La Liga and the Bundesliga. And crowds in the main haven't gathered outside these stadia. They have been televised, and these games, I understand, will also be televised. The The danger that you touch on does worry us a little bit and we'll be in touch with Police Scotland about how to manage that and that will be done the way Police Scotland always do it in a very balanced and friendly way if they possibly can but with enforcement if that is absolutely required. Scotland's uh, ready for this in a sense because they've been so keen for it but it is not guaranteed and if the virus goes in a certain direction or behaviour goes in a certain direction then again, there is always a reverse gear. But I am encouraged by today's announcement and keen for those behind closed doors games to get back. Thanks, Jason. Uh, David Ball from the Herald. Uh, 
Thank you, First Minister. Uh, you've spoken previously about your ambition for a green economic recovery in tandem with your pledge for Scotland to become carbon neutral. Uh, given that that is likely to require billions of extra investment, does the lack of um, fiscal flexibility from the UK government put both of its ambitions uh, under threat? And what sort of role um, will the private sector likely have to play financially if they are to become a reality? I'm going to hand over to Fiona on this in a second, but actually it's a timely question. We've just had an economy subcommittee of the Cabinet this morning and, and both of these aspects were uh, amongst our, our discussions. Uh, firstly, yes, the, the lack of greater fiscal flexibility for the Scottish Government will inhibit um, our ability to respond to this uh, economic uh, legacy of the pandemic in a number of ways. And we continue to make that case, as do the other devolved governments to the Treasury, and hopefully we'll see uh, a more positive uh, response to that in the not-too-distant future. Uh, the private sector, I think, have a, a big part to play here, and the energy companies, uh, I know, want to play that part, and Fiona may want to say more about this, uh, but there's also a regulatory uh, inhibitor here, and some of the, the recent decisions that Ofgem have taken hold that back too. So we want the UK government not just to think a bit more fiscal flexibility, but how we make sure that the, the regulatory framework doesn't get in the way of harnessing the, the private sector investment that is there to help us with this. So Scotland is extremely well placed to steer an economic recovery. That's going to be important for a number of reasons, a good opportunity for jobs, but also to uh, make sure that we uh, reach our climate change targets. There's so much we can do. One of the early announcements that I made was a £62 million transition fund for the North East, particularly in terms of energy. But the levers for change to get the billions of pounds worth of investment that we know we need, by and large, as of now, currently lie with the UK government. I have regular discussions with uh, Minister Zahawi and also with Alex Sharma, the Secretary of State. Uh, in my last meeting with Wales, Northern Ireland and the Secretary of State, Alex Sharma, I impressed on him the importance of the UK using the powers they have, particularly in regulation, uh, particularly in issues around transition, because if we're going to really retrofit uh, mass parts of our housing estate uh, to include different types of low carbon uh, in terms of energy provision. If we're really going to be serious about hydrogen and making sure that we have a hydrogen future for Scotland, and if we're serious about carbon capture and storage, we need the UK to come forward with that ca new capital stimulus. We've had a recycled capital sim stimulus announced by the Prime Minister. What we're really looking for is that real drive in terms of that billions of pounds. And in terms of what that means, it means that we can help uh, the companies, many of them based here in Scotland, that are really powerful in terms of their ambition to make sure that they can bring to the table the billions of investment that would be needed. And we know there are companies, and we heard most recently from Scottish Power, who are very eager to take that forward. There are other com uh, companies as well looking at offshore renewables, what they can do. But we don't have a level playing field even for that. So there's so many things that can be done, but we really need the UK government to use their powers to make sure they do their part. We stand w ready, willing and able, and the impact we can have, particularly in jobs for young people, could be enormous as part of the green recovery. Thank you. And the last question today is uh, Kenny McBride from Broadcast in Scotland. Thank you, First Minister, and uh, congratulations to everyone involved on another death-free day. That seems like very good news. Um, there have been a lot of numbers thrown around uh, recently. Um, could you and or the Economy Secretary just clarify exactly how much additional funding uh, the Scottish Government has received, uh, both from lo in lockdown generally and from the Chancellor's statement this week? I was wondering especially uh, that given the cut to VAT rates and the impact that VAT has on the, the Scottish budget, uh, has there, is there any offset uh, involved there to, to compensate for the, the cut in the VAT rate and the, the impact that would have on the Scottish budget? And also, if you could, uh, the Scotland office has been putting out Facebook ads telling people to get out and enjoy themselves. Um, could you tell me, has that been done in consultation with the Scottish Government? Um, not to my knowledge, and I haven't seen the Facebook ads, but I, I'm not aware of uh, any consultation. Obviously, the Scottish Government has its own, uh, you know, very strong, I think, uh, public health 
uh, messages uh, through uh, both television, radio and, and social media. And, and I would encourage everybody to, to pay attention to, to those messages. And I want people to enjoy themselves as well. I want people to enjoy the freedoms that we haven't had for a long time. But I really want people to do it safely because as we see, you know, you've heard me this week talk about Melbourne on many occasions and you know, it, it's a place I keep thinking about and talking about because I know if we wind the clock back just a, a few weeks, they had infection levels probably lower, lower than, than Scotland, and and now they're back in a if six week lockdown effectively. So I know how quickly this can go wrong, and if that happens, we will see more lives lost, we'll see more people suffering illness, but we'll also see our economy uh, just as it's starting to take these. Uh, careful steps to recovery set back to and and so we need to build this sustainable foundation now because that is what will give us the the best long-term chance of recovery so please enjoy the freedoms but do so safely and do so uh, very carefully and um, i'll hand over to uh, fiona on the, the 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 money and the consequentials one thing i would say is though the vat doesn't operate in that way yet we, we know we don't yet have uh, the devolution of the, the assignment of VAT revenues. Um, there is no proposal at the moment to give us the, the power to uh, set VAT rates, but there uh, has been a proposal to, to assign a share of VAT revenues, but that hasn't come into uh, operation yet. Uh, just briefly on VAT, remember that the UK had the second highest VAT level for tourism and hospitality uh, in the whole of Europe and so therefore the, the cut to 5% is very welcome and actually I think will help businesses through that area. It's something we've called for not just uh, during this period but also previously. Uh, Ireland did it uh, 10 years ago as part of an economic stimulus uh, and it was effective. In terms of the consequentials, uh, the, we understand there to be £804 million pounds of Barnet consequentials. Uh, almost all of them have been previously announced. So, for example, the £97 million pounds, uh, that was set out by the UK government on arts and culture, which I welcomed, would be part of that. But in terms of the majority of that, £466 million pounds of that was for the PPE procurement. Um, and obviously, we understand the importance and need for that. Uh, I talked about the £97 million pounds, uh, to support arts and culture. But the real concern is that the only economic, the only new economic stimulus in terms of the funding that comes to the Scottish Government's budget is the £21 million, pounds, welcome as it is, on the jobs front. Uh, we need to work with the UK Government in terms of looking at what they'll be doing in terms of their wider jobs area, and, and that is an important contribution, I, I don't doubt. But what it doesn't do is provide us with the tools in terms of the Scottish Government to tailor our response to Scotland's needs. So I hope that gives you some explanation of that, and indeed that, uh, that, is, that uh, set of figures has also been confirmed by uh, other reputable establishments as well. I saw actually a, a registered, I think, a, a piece from the Fraser of Islander Institute, which set out uh, the, the sort of breakdown uh, that, that Fiona has has gone through. Um, can I just finally on that say uh, we welcome every penny of the uh, the financial interventions that the UK government uh, has made. I've, you've heard me welcome them right throughout this crisis. I think the job retention scheme, for example, has been so important and and was very very welcome. All of the the consequentials that have come flowed through to the Scottish Government, uh, we welcome and they're important. And, you know, it's because we don't have the borrowing powers that we rely on the Treasury to, to use the borrowing powers they have in order to, to provide that financial intervention. So we do welcome it, but we need more than uh, what has been done. Uh, if you look at Germany, as an example, the, the fiscal stimulus there is something like 4% of their GDP. Now, what the Chancellor has announced, welcome though it is, is much less than that. So we will continue to welcome things, but we will continue to argue for the scale of response that we think is necessary. And of course, we will continue to argue for as much flexibility for the Scottish Government for us also to play our part in, in the economic recovery. Um, and I hope we will be able to work together uh, constructively uh, throughout this. That uh, concludes the questions today. My thanks to uh, Fiona and Jason and to Rachel, uh, who has been our BSL interpreter today. Thank you, as always, to the journalists and thanks to you for watching. Um, have a good weekend. Uh, you're able to do uh, a bit more this weekend than you were able to do last weekend. But as you have heard me and uh, Jason say repeatedly throughout this uh, briefing, please do it safely, uh, responsibly and carefully. I implore you to follow all of the advice. If, if we do that, then we can continue to have these freedoms while not allowing the virus to run out of control. So I'm going to leave you uh, with facts, 
face coverings, the law in shops and public transport, but in any enclosed space where you can't physically distance, wear a face covering. Avoid crowded places, not just indoors, but outdoors as well. Clean your hands regularly, thoroughly. Clean hard surfaces that are being touched. Two metres distance, because you hear now that there are some limited sectors with an exemption to that if they have other mitigations in place, doesn't change the fact that we are uh, encouraging everybody to keep two metres distance from people in other households as a general rule. Uh, and of course, self-isolate and get uh, a test immediately if you have symptoms of the virus. If we all stick to these five things, then we give ourselves the best possible chance of making uh, phase three uh, not the, the risky venture that sometimes we fear that might send us backwards, but the springboard uh, to a much brighter future. Uh, we have a brighter future if we do this right, so let's make sure we do it right. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll be back here on Monday at 12.30. Please do have a good weekend.